<clears throat> so it doesn't take a rocket scientist. Now, is rocket science even really that hard? Yes. Really? I feel like computers can do it all now. Yeah. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist <laughs> to look around and realize something is not right in the world. It's messed up. And people like to often point outwards, outside of themselves, and say things like, society is so broken. The culture is so messed up. And it's true. It's, it's, it's true. Society is broken and the culture is messed up. But just wait a minute. Take a step back and ask a few questions. Now, what is a society? What is a culture? It's not that hard. Again, it doesn't take a rocket scientist. Societies and cultures are groups of people. That's all they are just a bunch of individuals together. <clears throat> and if society is messed up, it's because people are messed up. You can't look outside of yourself and say, boy, society's messed up. You are society. <laughs> you, you're part of it. You're in it. Maybe you're, maybe you're not contributing to the messed up parts because, well, nobody here is, obviously, right? So... <laughs> Oh, guys, give me something. You are. You're messed up. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> it's our fault. Wh wh why, though? Why are we messed up? Why are we broken? What is the origin of this brokenness? Why can we seem to never get harmony or peace in our lives or in the world at large? If you want to know why, you have to go back in time. You have to know how we got here. Brokenness is a result of sin. That's the quick answer and the most accurate answer. And when sin entered the world, it corrupted everything, every single thing. Not just humans, literally everything. But we also live in this strange duality where <clears throat> we see brokenness everywhere, right? You see it. You're not blind. But at the same time, we also see redemption, don't we? It's not all bad. It's not all broken. There's also redemption. We also see brokenness and sin and suffering being used for good, being used in redemptive uh, means. There's a silver lining. We see hope in the midst of brokenness. And this duality exists because it existed <coughs> Excuse me, in the beginning when sin first entered the world. When Adam and Eve sinned, God judged them. But in the midst of that dark moment, God also promised redemption. He didn't just judge them and say, get out of here. He left them with a promise. And today we look around and we see brokenness and we see sin, but God is still offering redemption and hope in the middle of that. He has not left us to just wallow in sin and die. You know, that's what the world will tell you. you, you get, you're born, <clears throat> you grow up, you get a job, get married, have kids, and die. But that's not what you were made for. You were made for something greater for redemption, for eternal life. God promised us a Savior to stomp out our enemy for us and to clothe us in his righteousness. So let's open our Bibles to Genesis 3. Let's hop into our time machines. Go back in time a little bit, <clears throat> all the way to the beginning, and see how we got here. Genesis 3.1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. 
But the serpent said to the woman, you, sh you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So chapter 3 introduces us to a new ominous character, simply referred to as the serpent. If you read the end of Genesis chapter 2 into the beginning of chapter 3, you'll notice how abrupt this <laughs> introduction of the serpent really is. We have chapters that break up our Bibles, but if you, to, if you were to remove cha the chapters and the verses and just have a, 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 a smooth narrative, it's like, whoa, what's going on? This is, who is this serpent? You know, man and woman are created, <clears throat> and the last thing we're told before chapter one, or chapter three, is that the man and woman were naked and not ashamed. So everything's good, <laughs> you know? Man and woman are in the garden, they're naked, they're not ashamed, things are going really well. Then all of a sudden, bam, the serpent was more crafty. We, you know, you don't even have time to sit back, take in the beauty of God's creation, have a, you know, mango or whatever, and uh, just enjoy it. You don't even have the time before our attention gets dis directed to this suspicious character. It's like, give us a break, you know? Give me a couple of verses to just take this all in, Lord, you know? No. Boom. Serpent. Who is this serpent? What's going on here? We're told he's more crafty than any other beast God had made. Now, this word crafty means to be skilled in deception. Skilled in deception. He... How do I describe this? He was a practitioner of deception. Skilled. Knew what he was doing. Premeditated. It's almost like God is giving us a clue before we read on. The serpent is trouble and he's really good at one thing. Deceiving you. <clears throat> Which is interesting because even though we get that clue... Even though God tells us from the outset, this one is good at deception, we're still deceived. <laughs> we still get deceived, even though he told us flat out. The serpent begins to speak to the woman, and he asks her a cunning question. He says, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Now, from Eve's perspective, cut her some slack. She is your mother, after all. This probably seemed like an innocent question, right? Did God really say, he, you know? But this is the question that is the seed of every evil ever perpetrated. Every single sin begins with this question. Did God really say? Did God really say life begins at conception? No, no. Just go ahead, have that abortion. Did God really say you can't drink copious amounts of alcohol on the weekends? I'll go ahead and have another drink. The question, did God really say, is meant to undermine his authority. To question, did he really say that? Did he really mean that? Are you sure? So Eve answers back. She does a good job at first, right? No. God said we can eat of any tree in the garden, except for the one in the midst. If we eat that, he said, we will surely die. So the serpent, right, he goes, come on, Eve. No, 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 you got this all messed up. You misinterpreted it, see? Let me help you understand. God knows when you eat of it, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. You got this thing mixed up, Eve. I'm here to help you, right? I'm from the government. I'm here to help you. <laughs> You'll become like God. God knows this. You won't die. Don't you want to be like God? Of course. There's a lesson here. Sin always complicates simple things. God's command was very clear. It was very simple, right? Anybody can, hey, just don't eat from that one tree. That's it. Do whatever you want aside from that. Very simple to understand. 
But sin always comes in to insert complexity where there is no complexity. Sin always causes you to second-guess God's clear word by appealing to your own understanding. God said you shall not commit adultery. Pretty simple concept, isn't it? But you got it all wrong, right? God knows. God knows if you don't stay true to yourself and get with that other person, you'll never be happy. God wants you to be happy, right? Right? I mean, come on. God, God wouldn't have allowed you to have feelings for your secretary. He didn't want you to act on them. Did God really say that? No, no, you misinterpreted it. That's what sin does. It muddies the clear spring of God's truth to the point where you can't see the shark of sin that's sneaking up behind you to devour you. It, it, it puts complexity where there is none. It causes you to second guess and to do all kinds of wacky things. So let's see how Eve does with the serpent here. Verse 6. <clears throat> Let's see, where am I? Okay. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden, of the garden. <clears throat> so many of us have heard this story so many times that I fear it's lost its essence. You know, this is not some nice little children's story. This is not an allegorical tale for personal reflection. This is not an ancient poem to muse over. This is a real-life horror story. What happened here was... Cosmic treason, the singular event in history that directed the cause of every evil ever committed. And not just that, this singular event is the direct cause of every so-called natural disaster. Every man, woman, and child who has ever died of any reason, really, sickness, disease, earthquakes, you name it, is a result of this event. Why? Because when Adam and Eve ate that fruit, it plunged every single one of us in the whole universe into disarray, sin and death. And not only did it shatter our relationship with God, it decayed the whole creation. When we read this story, <clears throat> let the images of tragedy and starvation and abuse and death, let that overshadow it. Understand, that's where it started. It's dark, it's heavy, and frankly, it is horrifying. Now, some would say, you know, why such doom and gloom? You know, you said you're going to be positive today. All this because they ate some fruit. Seems a little bit disproportionate from first glance. <laughs> But it wasn't the act of eating by itself that makes this so horrifying. It's who the act was committed against. The infinite holy God who made all things by the word of his mouth commanded them not to eat from that tree. <clears throat> What's so bad about that? It wasn't the knowledge of good that was the problem, right? I said this in a previous message. It was the knowledge of evil that God was trying to protect them from. And by choosing to heed the words of the serpent and attain the knowledge of good and evil, what Adam and Eve did was spurn God and plunge the world into sin. Now, sinning against God is not the same as sinning against man. Okay, let's get that straight. Even in the world, we understand this. I've used this illustration a lot because I think it's very accurate. If you were to Will Smith me right now and walk up here and slap me in the face... I'll be angry with you, right? Hey, what'd you do that for? You know, maybe I'll crack a joke like Chris Rock did. But I'll, I'll forgive you. I'll forgive you. 
and it'll end there. All right, if you are Will Smith and you do walk up and slap Chris Rock in the face, you know, there'll be some memes online. You'll get banned from the award ceremonies for 10 years, and that's it. You slap a police officer, you'll probably get tased, maybe shot, but probably tased. Locked in jail for a night or so. If you slap a judge, you're in big trouble, right? You're going to jail for sure. And probably longer than if you were to slap a cop. Now, if you were to walk up to Justin Trudeau, which I know a lot of you want to do, but don't. But if you were to walk up to Justin Trudeau and slap him in the face, you might get killed. Right? He has armed guards. And if you walk up and slap him in the face, they might kill you. They might literally shoot and kill you. As you work your way up the ladder of authority, the punishment becomes more severe. What do you suppose will happen if you were to slap God Almighty in the face by spurning his word? This act of rebellion was so heinous because of who it was committed against. That's the core issue here. Not necessarily the act. It's who the act is offending. It's who the act is spurning and disrespecting. Death is the sentence for disobeying God because disobeying God is to embrace evil and lies. And God, being the wellspring and essence of life, cannot corrupt himself with evil and lies. So death is just the natural effect of sin. It has to be that way. How can God, who is life, dwell with lies and evil? He can't do that. So notice the first thing Adam and Eve do after they eat the fruit. They realize they're naked. They felt shame. There was no shame up to this point. So instead of going to God for a solution for their error, what do they do? Well, they take matters into their own hands. So they get some fig leaves and they sew them together and they make clothes to cover their shame. And immediately after sin enters the world, mankind begins to look for a works-based salvation right away. The first thing they do, I got to fix this myself. That's what sin does. Sin says, indulge in me. It's okay. God knows. He understands. He's cool with it. Despite the fact that you know God said, said you shouldn't do that thing, then when you do sin, God, a sin says, oh no, you messed up. You better get to work and fix this before God sees. Look what you did. Fix it. The common thread in both of those scenarios is self-reliance. Did God really say, oh, I could do this. I know better than God. And then you do it and you realize, "Uh uh-oh, God really did mean what he said. So let me try to clean it up. Let me try to fix it. In both instances, you're relying on yourself. So instead of taking it to God, what they did was they hid from him. They made some... Anybody see a fig leaf before? Are, Are they big? I've never seen a fig leaf. They had to really work pretty hard to sew those leaves together, didn't they? To make clothing for themselves. <clears throat> How pathetic. And that really is an analogy of our works, isn't it? Pathetic. God, let, I'm going to... Like bringing your works to God and saying, you know, here's my works, here are my merits, Lord. It, it's as pathetic as a fig leaf pair of underwear. It's pathetic. It's leaves. It's trash. You're supposed to wipe with leaves, not make clothes with them. (laughs) At least I think that's how they used to wipe back then, before Charmin, Ultrasoft, and all that. (laughs) Yeah. What a futile thing to do to think you can hide from the one who created the eye. Think about that. Can God not see? Right? Is he who made the eye blind? Is he who made the ears deaf? Like... Let's make some, you know, underwear out of some leaves and hide from God. Is this how stupid sin makes you? It makes you really dumb. It makes you do really stupid, irrational things. Okay. So how does this story end? Let's see. Verse 9. <clears throat> I'm going down to uh, 13 here. Okay. 
But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you, whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. The Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. If anyone's been married for any amount of time, the story should ring very relevant. God knew what had happened, and so he calls out, Adam, where are you? The sound of God's rhetorical question thundered through the earth. And, you know, I read this now as a father, and I sympathize with the Lord, you know. <laughs> My kids run away, and they do ridiculous things. And I call out, where are you? I know where they are. I know where they are. I'm just trying to give them a chance to repent. <laughs> Show yourself, and it will be easier for you, my son. <laughs> That's what's going on here. Where are you? Dad's home, and he's not happy. So what ensues is sin's corrupting effect working itself out. They had a chance to take responsibility for their wrongdoing, but instead the marriage of Adam and Eve experiences some upheaval. So first, God goes to Adam. And Adam answers the Lord first, and he says, I was afraid. I was afraid when I heard you coming because I'm naked and I hid from you. So God asks, wait a minute, who told you you were naked? Did you, wait a minute, did you eat from the tree I told you not to eat from? See how patient God is? He's trying to draw it out. Adam. Adam, just be honest. Just tell me what happened. Like, I'm the solution here. Stop running. God doesn't drop the hammer right away. He questions Adam. He's trying to pull the truth out of him. So what does Adam do? <clears throat> does he own up? Does he man up? Does he say, I'm sorry, God. Forgive me. I need you. I messed up. No. He does what every son of Adam has done since then. And he points to his wife. He says, it's her fault. <laughs> It's her fault. And not only that, he goes a step further. He blames God. He says, the woman you gave me. <laughs> if you just wouldn't have given her to me, I wouldn't be in this, this mess. The woman you gave me, she gave me the fruit. Dang it. God, oh, what are we going to do with her? <laughs> you know? You see how quickly the, the, the corruption of sin has, has taken, taken hold, how quickly it seized Adam? <clears throat> he had just sinned, and he had just spurned God, and he was afraid and ashamed, and he hid himself. And when confronted about it, he blames God and his wife. <clears throat> then God looks at the woman and says, okay, well, what have you done? Is this true? To which she responds, no, no, it was the serpent's fault. He deceived me. So it went, you know, he's going down the chain of command here. Adam, what happened? It was your fault because of her. Okay, what happened? Well, it was the serpent's fault. No one owned up to it. No one sought mercy. They just passed the blame. Can't be my fault, surely. I'm perfect. <laughs> Had to be their fault. Had to be God's fault. And, and, I mean, don't you hear that all the time? Now, from the sons of Adam, the daughters of Adam, if God is so great, why fill in the blank? Right? Oh, this horrible thing happened. It's God's fault. I'm not, we shouldn't be surprised. I mean, Adam did it right from the beginning. But in this dark scene, there's a bright light that bursts on the scene because God turns to the serpent and curses the serpent, <clears throat> and in the curse of the serpent, he preaches the gospel, which is like mind-blowing. Look at this, verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, <clears throat> because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring, 
he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So God turns to the serpent, and he curses him. And then he says something really peculiar. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. Now, this isn't just talking about humans and snakes, okay? Um, the reality is humans have tamed snakes. We've all seen the videos of the snake charmers with their flutes and all that kind of stuff. This is a spiritual enmity. The devil and his offspring will be the enemy of the woman and her offspring. Forever, the spiritual entity of the devil will be at odds with the creatures God made in his image. <clears throat> but God gets more specific. He narrows it down to a singular man. He shall bruise your head. You shall bruise his heel. And in the curse of the serpent, God announces redemption for mankind. Imagine the relief in Adam's, Adam and Eve's soul when they heard that. Oh, that's good news. That's good news. One of our offspring is going to crush the serpent's head. Maybe they thought, oh, maybe we're not going to die after all. Who knows what they thought, but it's good news. He's promising, despite the fact that the man and the woman disobeyed, there was coming a man from the woman who would deal a fatal blow to the serpent who deceived them. <clears throat> and this is what theologians call the proto-evangelion. That's a Greek word, which means the first telling of the gospel. Everything up to this point in history was good news. <clears throat> There's no such thing as bad news. As fallen humans, we're very familiar with bad news, are we not? We receive bad news often. All you got to do is turn on a mainstream news outlet if you want bad news. Very simple to get it. Abundant. Now, have you ever noticed that mainstream news media primarily only delivers bad news? I mean, they have like every now and then a feel-good story to keep you coming back or something. I don't know. Oh, there's some new puppies at the Humane Society. It's like a two-minute segment. And then, <clears throat> oh, war, and then the rest is just death and destruction and horrible stuff. And you know why this is? They know. <clears throat> they know bad news is addictive. Bad news makes us angry, makes us sad. And anger and sadness typically moves us more than a generic sense of happiness. At least in the moment. It's more knee-jerk reaction. You just come back more and more and more. You want that. In a strange way, we want to be angry. We want something to be outraged at. Social media figure this out. Tailors your news feeds with information that makes you mad. Because they know it will make you come back. I'm all, every time I'm on Facebook, I'm mad. Man, look at this stupid thing that happened. You know, or I'm, I'm on Twitter. Oh, I'm recording this on my phone here, so I'm not going to. Bet you if I open Twitter right now, I'd see something that made me upset. Something stupid that happened in the world. Because they know. They figure the algorithm knows what makes you mad. Because it keeps making you come back. And they see, oh, he lingered on that story a little longer. Let's give him more of that. Because we're sinful. Because we're fallen. Because we're accustomed to bad news. And become skeptical when good news is presented to us. But there is good news. And I'm here to announce that you don't have to be skeptical of it. God was the first teller of the gospel. God himself was the first to preach the gospel. And what makes this even more remarkable is the fact that, excuse me, <coughs> it was actually God the Son who first told the gospel. He manifested himself in the garden. He announced his own coming when he would crush the serpents. And in essence, he looked at the devil and he said, I'm coming for you. <laughs> I'm coming for you. I'm coming to get you. You might have deceived the woman and her husband. You think you're a big shot now. But I'm coming for you directly. And although this was unbelievably good news at the moment for Adam and Eve, who were surely hopeless, God still had business to attend to with them. <clears throat> and he does lay down the law here in verse 16. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. 
Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Curse is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. <clears throat> God curses the man and the woman. Just as he said, you will die. Those things that God commanded them to do have now transitioned from pleasurable tasks of creation to pain and toil. Instead of pleasure and enjoyment um, in working the garden, in multiplying, it will now be painful and agonizing. <sighs> yeah, work sucks. <laughs> Um, any woman who's had a child knows it's not very fun to give birth. Anybody give birth here and have a great time? <laughs> Nobody? You wouldn't just like, if you had the option, just like perpetually be in that state of birthing? No? Are you sure? I, I, I don't know how it is. I've never done it, so I'm just asking. No, it's not fun, is it? It hurts. It's agonizing. There's a reason they call it. Yeah, well, we'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> That's a grace of God, right? That's a grace of God. They call it labor for a reason. And now the man works, toils the ground by the sweat of his brow. He eats. <clears throat> not even the dirt escaped. Not even the dirt escaped the consequences, because the dirt is even, is even uh, cursed. It's a disaster. Thorns and thistles. Uh, you know, every year so far, the Lord changes this year. <laughs> I've got stung by a bee. I like to think there were no bee stings before sin. <laughs> These sort of things, you know, people die from that kind of stuff. It's crazy. The, 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 the world is not this, <coughs> the earth is not this harmonious, glorious garden anymore, you know. You'll, you'll die out there without shelter, you know. You, you'll, you'll die. Animals will kill you. They don't care. Fight a tiger. You will lose. And God sent them out into that. He said, okay, that's it. You're gone. But before he does that, this happens. Verse 20, the man called his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living. <clears throat> and the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim with flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So before sending them out, <coughs> Adam with his wife Eve, God takes an animal and he kills it. This is a huge detail. The first death after the fall was not man. It was an animal. And God was the one who killed the animal. You see that? God killed this animal not to feed them, but to clothe them. And immediately after Adam and Eve sinned, they sought to clothe themselves, so they made fig leaf outfits, right? We learned about that. But that was not sufficient. That could not clothe them. They could not cover their nakedness. So God took it upon himself to clothe them in the skin of an animal. And from the very beginning, God's communicating salvation would only come by his works. Mankind is powerless to save themselves. God must do it. <clears throat> so fast forward 4,000 years, a Jewish man's hanging on the cross naked. Naked. We miss that detail, don't we? Beaten and bruised. He's so mutilated. You can hardly tell he's a human. Gasping for air, choking on his own blood. 
We see he's hung there between two thieves. One thief mocks him. The other thief calls him Lord. A group is there mocking him. And with the last ounce of strength he has, this man pushes up on the cross and he cries out, it is finished, and he dies. <clears throat> Make sure he's dead. They pierce his side, puncture his heart, and they bring his lifeless body down from the cross and they put him in a rich man's tomb. And of course, we know who that is. It's Jesus. And in that moment, God had slain his only son so that we could be clothed in his perfection. Jesus is the animal skin that the Lord clothes us in. The lamb. What do you think they, he's called the Lamb of God? Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 61, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 13, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Clothe yourself in him. Jesus is the promised one, the serpent crusher. He's also the animal skins that clothe our nakedness and makes us right with God. And a lot of people call Genesis 3 the fall of man, and it is that. It is the fall of man. However, I think the real message of Genesis 3 is redemption. In Genesis 3, we find a compelling and hope-filled message. Although the first part of it is a horror story, and it ought to fill us with horror, it ends with a promise. It ends with good news. It ends with redemption. The grace of God coming down to our level, shedding blood and covering our naked, helpless selves. The good news of Genesis 3 is the good news of the grace of God to save wretched sinners who chose their own way. Genesis 3 contains in it the whole story of human history, doesn't it? Man falls, God saves. That's that's succinctly as you can put human history. Man falls, God saves. The seed of the woman defeats the seed of the serpent and redeems mankind forever. Anybody here like rap music? I don't care. I'm going to play a song anyways. Not the whole song, just a clip of a song called The Greatest Story Ever Told. And I think Shy Lin is a Christian rapper. I don't think he raps anymore. or I think he just released a kid's album or something. But he's a pastor now as well. And I think Shy Lin does a great job. Oh, Dave, can you quickly run a speaker over so people can actually hear this? <clears throat> Sorry. I totally forgot I had this clip in here. I told you I'd be absent-minded today. I wasn't lying. Okay, so here's a clip from the song, The Greatest Story Ever Told, which sums up the good news that I'm talking about. Each of our lives is a story. And with each new person we meet, we become a part of that story, and they become a part of ours. The God who created the universe has somehow woven together these billions of stories into one story, which is the greatest story ever told. I right, check it. Let's go back in time, brethren. Divine lessons. Always keep your mind guessing. The glory of the triune gods while I'm stressing. The origin of humankind was fine blessings were plenteous. God is amazingly generous. Crazy benefits in a state of innocence. God told the man what he could taste was limited. Not long after came a nemesis in Genesis. He scanned well. Man fell, damned to hell. The whole human race, he represented it. Fooled by the serpent. Man through his work, woman through birth. Even the earth ruled by the curses. But instead of awake, immediately God said a seed would be the one to crush the head of the snake. Yo, wait, what's this? Whoa, what grace you give? And Jehovah's faithfulness, he clothed the nakedness. This was so they would know the Savior's kiss and bless. But first, many going pains exist. Suffering in the worst form, ugly deeds. Eve's firstborn seed made his brother bleed. Indeed, things got progressively worse. Every section of the earth been affected by the curse. And though God's judgment 
to get simple glory. Praise the Lord, it's not the end of the story. Yeah, I wasn't going to play the whole song, but the stories, just get out. No, I'm kidding. Uh, um, <clears throat> the story's not over, folks. The story's not over. Praise the Lord, it's not the end of the story. The story of the Bible is the story of human history, and it's about God saving sinners in this theater we call creation. The serpent crusher was coming, but first, many other things had to occur. And we really just begin our journey through Genesis now, don't we? The fun starts now. From here, sin would work itself out in the lives of God's imagers, but God would always be there to point them back to the hope of redemption. We're fallen creatures, but thanks be to God, Jesus came and put the serpent firmly under his everlasting heel. And the good news is he put him under our heel too. And I'm going to end with Romans 16, 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this day. <clears throat> Thank you for your good news. Lord, we look around and see horror and sin and death. And Remind us in the midst of this of your promise of redemption, how you came and you're coming again. You are alive. We look to you, God. Lord Jesus, give us strength, we pray in Jesus' name I ask these things. Amen. <clears throat>